Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a series of short personal true stories where we explore the idea that truth can be stranger than fiction. This week's story is entitled Halloween Monster Bash. pinnacle of the party, I catch a glimpse of myself reflected in the front door glass of our studio. I'm dressed as Gene Simmons from the band Kiss. Having been dancing and sweating, my bat-shaped black and white face paint is running badly, which makes me look like I've been crying, and my black lipstick is smeared. My appearance is that of a completely deranged person, yet the half a dozen cops that I'm conversing with are treating me with total respect. They have been called because a group of young towny punks have crashed our Halloween party, gotten drunk on our booze, and have been using their fists to punch holes in the sheetrock walls of our studio lofts. One of the crew's hands is bleeding profusely because he inadvertently punched a metal stud in the wall. All this led someone to call the police. I'm amazed when one of the very drunk and belligerent punks starts yelling at the cops, slurring his words. Are you pigs gonna kick the shit out of us like you did last time? Oink, oink. With that, the cops who've been restrained until now suddenly raise their nightsticks and club the whole band of punks to the floor, then cuff them all and drag them down the stairs by the feet with their heads bouncing on each step. It's a chilling display of police brutality. This happens midway through our Halloween party, and it's either the high point or the low point of our celebration, depending upon how you want to look at it. The Halloween Monster Bash, the official name of our event, is all taking place in Waltham Studios, a complex of 10 top-floor industrial loft spaces in a historic early factory building on Moody Street by the Charles River in Waltham, Massachusetts. Our particular mill building is part of a complex of a dozen old red brick buildings built by Robert Lowell, with plans stolen by John Moody, whom he sent to England to spy on and record how the British built and equipped their cotton mills. All the buildings in the complex were powered mechanically by a water wheel in the Charles River. Power was transferred from the water wheel by a series of cast iron shafts that ran to each floor of the buildings, running individual textile machines. In all of our studios, there are still many remnants of this equipment. Cast iron wheels on horizontal shafts, suspended on steel slings, hanging from our ceilings. The sound of the mill was supposed to be deafening, but I doubt if it could be any louder than our monster bash. When we moved in, before the floors were sanded and the walls went up, as the sun set one night, a raking light cast across the dark floors of the space highlighted scores of double footprint-sized depressions. Each of these paired depressions was made by a worker, many of whom were children, standing in one place at a machine, repeating the same motions over and over again. When I first observed this, I cut out a square section of the oak floor containing one of the pairs of footprints, which I kept as a reminder of what life in our building used to be like, and the ghosts who might still haunt it. When we first formed our studio group, I wanted to call us Moody Artists, named after Lowell's spy John Moody, but the other members of the group thought it wasn't serious enough, so they passed up a very memorable title and settled on the name Waltham Studios. How boring. Because the ceilings in the building are 20 feet tall, each 1,000 square foot loft has a second story and 18 foot tall metal gridded industrial windows. Perfect party spaces. Tonight, each loft has its own bar tended by its artist resident and its own music, some live, some recorded. The invites we sent out specified that no one would be allowed to enter without a costume. As the spaces fill up with Halloween revelers, it becomes apparent that many of the artists' residents have invited far more than the 30 people they were allowed. The party is going great. It looks like the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. 
The energy is crackling, and most of the visitors have spent some serious time on their costumes. Beside the usual ghosts and goblins, there are some real standouts. One woman is dressed like a Christian cross, and her husband is dressed as Jesus Christ. Then there's someone dressed as the boyfriend of Patty Hearst, the recently kidnapped heiress to the Hearst newspaper fortune. He's going around with a small picture of Patty, asking everyone if they've seen her. Also, there's a woman dressed in a semi-open bathrobe, holding aloft an open umbrella, squirting people with a squirt gun filled with milk. I can't guess what she's supposed to be, so after I inquire, she squirts me in the face and informs me that she's a wet dream. I'm a little freaked out because I'm not sure what exactly is in her squirt gun. Moving on, I interrupt two platinum blondes who are making out and ask them what they're supposed to be. They're dressed in identical shimmering silver spandex tights. They respond laughingly, calling out, Twincest in unison. Cruising the different party rooms, I discover Romans in togas, knights, horses, Cleopatra, the Beatles. Every possible costume I can imagine is here somewhere. There's also a big fat white snowball made from cotton. When she gives me a bear hug, I get white lint all over my black kiss costume. Bummer. As the party progresses, I climb the stairs to my loft, which is roped off so that no one climbs up and then falls off. When I enter the bedroom, someone dressed as a cowboy is going through the drawers of my desk. Sorry, he says. I was looking for matches, roughly brushing past me and races down the stairs, disappearing into the crowd. At this point, the whole police episode transpires, and the townie crashers are roughly disposed of, and we all get right back to partying. Now everyone is either drunk or high on drugs or both. Next, tragedy strikes. Joseph, one of the other artist residents, comes to me hysterical, saying that someone has been badly hurt after a fall from a loft. I ask, has someone called an ambulance? He's not sure, duh. So I ask him to call one, and I proceed through the crowd to the scene of the accident. A heavyset guy dressed as a friar in a brown sackcloth habit has plummeted down onto the drum set of the live band below. He's been impaled by a sharp object. The artist whose face it is digs out a cot which serves as a makeshift stretcher. While someone else keeps a compress in place to staunch the bleeding, the friar is transported down the freight elevator to await the arrival of the ambulance. I can hear the siren of the ambulance cutting through all the noise of the party, at which point all this just becomes too much for me. I go back to my space and sit down heavily on the bottom step of my stairway to collect myself. Now I make the biggest mistake of my night. Someone offers me a joint that they describe as a tie stick. It turns out that it's laced with a psychedelic of some type, and after a couple of deep tokes, my space appears to morph into a dark cave. I hear what sounds like a child's voice, and someone small and grease smudged runs past me in the corner of my vision at which point I pass out sprawled on my steps. After some dark and confusing dreams, I wake up around noon the next day. All I want to do is take an Alka-Seltzer and get it to my own bed and sleep it off. But first I have to drag three unconscious partygoers out of my space into the hallway and lock the door. As I drop into bed, I quote Shakespeare's Macbeth to myself. Sleep that knits the raveled sleeve of care. The second day after the Halloween monster bash, the late afternoon cleanup is massive. Eighty supersized bags of trash are collected, six high heel shoes, none of which match. I wonder how they all got home with only one shoe. There are all sorts of other cast offs jewelry, some valuable, used condoms. Masks of all types, vomit, a small bag of coke, and multiple pot pipes. It turns out also that artworks from various studio spaces have sustained damage. Several paintings have big holes punched into them, along with some cigarette burns. I suspect that this may be the work of the towny punk. There are also many burned areas and rugs and floors. Fires that luckily never really got going. Happy Halloween. Epilogue. A couple weeks after the party, 
I was online at my bank near our loft building. While I was doing business with an older female teller who I was familiar with, a young man excused himself, cut in front of me, and said, Mom, I need some money for school. As he turned to leave, I recognized him as one of the towny punks from the party. The lead punk, in fact. The one who yelled at the cops. His bruises were healing up nicely. While I was sorely tempted, I decided to give him a pass and not report him to his mother. Another day, when I was in downtown Boston buying a pair of shoes, the sales guy helping me looked familiar, but I couldn't quite place him. As he knelt down to shoehorn on one of my shoes, I remembered that he was the cowboy in my bedroom, rifling through my desk at the party. I asked him, did you ever go to a big party in Waltham? He smiled and started to answer, oh yeah, what a great, then he froze mid-sentence when he remembered my face. I decided not to buy the shoes after all and got up and walked out the door. I'll be damned if he was gonna make a commission from me. For years after the party, whenever I was in Boston and I told people I lived in the Moody Street Artist Building in Waltham, many would respond, wow, I know that building. I went to the greatest party I've ever been to out there. Are you ready to tell your own story on The Compulsive Storyteller? We're launching a new segment of guest storytelling, and we want to hear your stories. Email a voice recording to hello at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. I'll play selected stories on upcoming episodes. Try to be as clear as possible in your recording, and we reserve the right to lightly edit them for length and clarity. Leave your name or contact information in your voicemail or email, and let us know if you'd like the story to be anonymous. I can't wait to hear from you. The Compulsive Storyteller is now co-produced by Greg Lefebvre and Fadia Montserrat, who's also arranged the music and created the special effects. Emily Ramon does design, research, editing, and marketing. Peter Kakoma has made our theme music and for many seasons co-produced the show with me. If you enjoyed this week's episode, let us know. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Compulsive Storyteller, and we'd love to hear from you. This podcast is independently produced, so we really appreciate all your help and support. Share the show with your friends, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. You can also check out our website, thecompulsivestoryteller.com, for more information. Thanks for listening, and if you didn't like this one, the next one will be another story. All characters and events portrayed in this podcast are based on my truth, with some names and facts changed for privacy. The conversations and dialogues are based on my best memory, but are not word-for-word recreations. <laughs> <laughs>